What does it take to comprehend the universe? Imagine, if you will, a message born from the violent embrace of two black holes, each a colossal giant, more massive than our own sun, colliding near the speed of light somewhere in the distant cosmos. This message, a ripple in the fabric of space-time, embarked on a journey over a billion years ago, crossing the vast, silent expanse of the universe to reach us here on Earth in September 2015. The galaxy from which it hailed remains shrouded in mystery, its location lost to the cosmos. Yet its reverberations reached us, marking a pivotal moment in humanity's quest to understand the cosmos. Today, I share with you a cosmic discovery, a tale of human perseverance, humility, but also arrogance, chutzpah, that it takes to define our pursuit of knowledge. This story isn't just about the universe speaking to us, it's about what it means to listen and the remarkable individuals who heard its siren song. The heart of this narrative is the LIGO project, the Laser Interferometric Gravitational Wave Observatory. Kind of not mouthful, a marvel of human ingenuity designed to do what many thought to be impossible, to detect gravitational waves. Ripples in space-time, predicted by Albert Einstein himself over a century ago. Einstein was even dubious that these whispers of cosmic cacophonies would ever be detected. He considered them a mere mathematical curiosity. Boy, was he wrong. Yet among the visionaries who led this team was a beloved mentor of mine named Barry Barish a member of the LIGO team who would later be honored with a Nobel Prize for his monumental discovery. But this journey was anything but straightforward for the universe and for Barry as well. It was a testament to the resilience, dedication, and sometimes the heartbreak that accompanies the path of discovery. To win the Nobel Prize requires meeting multiple stringent criteria and partially would recognize only three individuals, leaving behind many unsung heroes, including Ron Drever, a pioneering physicist whose contributions were pivotal. But he passed away months before he could be among the troika of Nobel Prize winners. Imagine that, passing away just a few months in comparison to the billion year long journey these waves of gravity had set up upon. Truly, it shows you the futility of pursuing sometimes these great idols, these accolades that scientists like me worship in our daily lives. It's a stark reminder of the transient nature of recognition and fame, and that the eternal flame of curiosity should be one that drives us all. Just think, if these monster black holes, billion light years away, had collided just mere weeks earlier, Ron Drever would also have won the Nobel Prize, and not my good friend Barry. But getting back to Barry, Barry reminded me of a trait that was represented by Rabbi Simcha. This great rabbi said that a man should have two pockets. In one pocket, he should have a note. And in that note, it should say, the whole universe was made for me. In his other pocket, he should carry a note that says, I am nothing but dust and ashes. I spoke to Barry on my podcast, Into the Impossible, and I was struck by an unexpected revelation. Despite reaching the pinnacle of what all scientists aspire to, the Nobel Prize, he continued to struggle with the doubts that many of us, myself included, have struggled with for decades. I asked him, Barry, as I ask all my guests, what advice would you give to your 20-year-old self near the end of our conversation? Barry surprised me. He said, I would tell myself to get over the imposter syndrome, even after I won the Nobel Prize. I was flabbergasted. Barry, I said, are you kidding me? You've won the Nobel Prize. How can you possibly have the imposter syndrome? Barry told me something I'll probably never know, given my first book was called Losing the Nobel Prize. Barry told me that when you win a Nobel Prize, you go to Sweden to accept the gilded graven medallion featuring Alfred Nobel's visage. You bow down in front of the King of Sweden who presents it to you. You're wearing mandatory regalia and you collect a check worth over 1 million US dollars. When you win it, they wanna make sure you're not gonna come back, justifiably so, and say, Where's my money? Where's my prize? So they make you sign a ledger, according to Barry. And Barry, when he signed that ledger, was struck by the awesome cohort that he had now become associated with. He was a curious man, he told me, and so he turned the pages backwards and saw who signed it the year before, the year before that, and found some of our greatest heroes in physics, including UC San Diego's own Maria Gephardt Mayer, including Richard Feynman, the great flamboyant Nobel Prize winner Enrico Fermi, featured prominently in the Oppenheimer story. But then he came upon Albert Einstein. And when he saw Albert Einstein, he felt wholly unworthy, an imposter standing before such a great scientist. How could he possibly be recognized in the same 
sentence, let alone in the same book. I said, Barry, I've got good news for you. Not only do you deserve to be there, but Einstein himself had the imposter syndrome as well. Barry was flabbergasted. Are you kidding me? Einstein, one of the greatest minds in all of human history. I said, Barry, Albert Einstein said he felt himself the imposter syndrome when he thought of the paucity of his contributions to science compared to those of his hero, Isaac Newton. Wow, said Barry. And I took a deep breath and said, Barry, but that's not all. Even Isaac Newton felt wholly inadequate before his hero. Who is that? Said Barry. And I said, it wasn't Galileo. It wasn't Copernicus. It was Jesus Christ. In fact, Newton so idolized his hero and savior that he tried to emulate Jesus in every way he could. Didn't mean he could turn water into wine, even though Newton did try to turn lead into gold. He couldn't pull off the alchemy of loaves into fishes or water into wine, but he could do something that Jesus also did, which is to die a virgin. Barry's honesty and his humility opened a window into what it takes to be a good scientist. And it caused me to reevaluate the pursuits that I had long had. His relentless questioning, the doubts, the insecurity, the humility, but also the great arrogance, the chutzpah that you must have to pursue the greatest possible goals capable of achievement by the human species. His words echo the sentiments of great minds before him. So this story, our story as scientists, is a reminder of the pursuit of knowledge. The word science in Latin, scientia, means knowledge. It doesn't mean wisdom. It's a journey marked not by the certainty of our findings, but by the questions we dare to ask and the humility with which we receive the answers. The universe is vast and its secrets are many, but in our quest to unravel them, we hear not just the echoes of the cosmos, but sometimes the echoes of doubt within ourselves as well. And those are fine to have. So continue to lessen, question yourself, but marvel at the capabilities that you have as a mere human being with just these two pockets. The universe was made for you.